Hi, welcome to the first mini lecture for module one of New Testament survey. In this first module, we're giving ourselves to ask some of the key questions that help frame and guide our reading of the New Testament, and that will frame our reading of the New Testament throughout this course. And in this brief lecture, I'd like to ask one of those questions, and that's simply this. How do we read the Bible, more particularly the New Testament, a testament in which most of the books were written almost 2,000 years ago? How do we read the Bible in today's world? Another way of putting that question may be to ask, what does Jerusalem, the political center of Jesus' day where Jesus was tried and convicted and put to death on a cross, have to do with Washington, the political center of our day? How do we read the Bible in a non-biblical world? To begin to answer that question, we must first ask the question of what unites the books of the New Testament together as a whole? Why is it that these books are brought together in a single testament? And what is this a testament to? And throughout history, the answer to that question has been very clear. The New Testament is a testament to Jesus Christ. And over and over and over again in the New Testament, you see this question being asked and answered. Who is Jesus Christ? In fact, when the early church in the 3rd and 4th centuries were deciding which books belong to sacred scripture, and decided on the 27 books that we now know as the canon of the New Testament, they said, books that are sacred scripture are those that faithfully answer this question. Who is Jesus Christ? It is a question that Jesus himself asks, in fact, in the gospel, asking his disciples directly, Who do you say that I am? And of course, people in Jesus' time and throughout the New Testament and throughout history have answered that in many different ways. Some said that he is the Son of Man, a human being that was sent by God on a special mission. Others say that he is the Son of God himself. Still others say that he is a kind of divine Savior. Some say that he is simply another prophet, or that he is a special kind of priest, or that he is a, a special teacher, a rabbi, or even others say that he is a king. But perhaps the answer that sounds loudest throughout the New Testament is the answer that Peter himself, one of Jesus' disciples, gives to this question when Jesus asks it of his disciples. Peter says, declares, in fact, you are the Christ. Now, it is important for us to understand something here. Christ is not Jesus' last name. In fact, Christ is a title. It comes from the Greek word Christos, which is a translation of the Hebrew word Mashiach, which we know as the word Messiah. Christ simply means Messiah. And who was the Messiah? The Messiah was that one that the Jews believed would be sent especially by God to overcome the powers of this world who were dealing oppression and injustice to people throughout history, and particularly to the people of Israel. The Messiah is the one who would come to overthrow these powers and to establish a new world in which God's love was the reign and the rule. And so to say that Jesus is the Christ is just to say that Jesus himself is the embodiment of the reign of God. Jesus himself is the one who has come to overthrow and overturn the unjust powers of this world and to establish the rule of God's love. Now, it is important to understand just how dangerous of an idea this would have been in Jesus' time. So dangerous, in fact, that when Peter declared to Jesus, you are the Christ, Jesus says, don't tell anyone about this. Because he knew that the truth of this reality 
was in fact a real threat to the political powers of his day, and that eventually it would get him arrested, put on trial, convicted, and put to death on a cross. It would lead to his crucif crucifixion. And the reason why this was such bad news for the powers of the day is because Jesus proclaimed God's love and God's reign as such good news for those who were marginalized and oppressed and who were kicked to the curb, if you will, by the powers of his time. In fact, when Luke introduces Jesus to the public, he has Jesus go into the synagogue, the Jewish place of worship, and read from the book of the prophet Isaiah the following words. Reading from Isaiah, Jesus says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus then rolls up the scroll and says, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Listen to what is happening here. Jesus embodies God's reign by going to those who are most oppressed, marginalized, and beaten down by the powers of this world, those who are most suffering the weight of injustice. And he insists that these persons are central to understanding who he is. In fact, Jesus says, if you do not fight for freedom for those who are imprisoned, if you do not fight for the healing of the sick, if you do not fight for the feeding of the hungry, if you do not fight for the liberation of the, the oppressed, you do not know me, and I never knew you. So when we ask the question, who is Jesus Christ, when reading the New Testament, we have to ask the question from the perspective of the marginalized and the poor and the oppressed of Jesus' time. What does liberation for the oppressed look like? What does healing of the sick look like? What does feeding of the hungry look like? What does freedom for the captive look like? In the New Testament. So let's go back to that original question that we asked. How do we read the Bible in today's world? How do we read the Bible in a non-biblical world? Does, in fact, Jerusalem have anything to do with Washington? And to answer that question, we have to ask the question, who is Jesus Christ for us today? And to answer that question, we have to have the perspective and answer that question from the perspective of those who are most marginalized and those who are most oppressed by the political and religious powers of our own day. To understand who Jesus is for us today, we must learn to read the New Testament from the perspective of those persons, the prisoner, the immigrant, the, the abused mother, the outsider, and the outcast, the Black, brown or black person in America, the lesbian, the gay, the bisexual, the transgendered person in America. This is the point the authors of our textbook, Mitzi Smith and Young Suk Kim, want to press upon us. All of these perspectives of the oppressed throughout history, from the New Testament in Jesus' time, throughout history to the oppressed of today, have to come together and give us the perspective of answering the question, who is Jesus Christ? They call this intersectionality, and you will read about that in the reading for this week. But the important point to get for now is this. To read the Bible in today's world is to ask, what does freedom look like for the immigrant? What does life look like for the poor? What does justice look like for the oppressed? Not then, but now, today. To read the Bible in today's world is to read the Bible in solidarity with these persons through their eyes and understanding, understand that it is for them that the reign of God has come near. This is, of course, a very difficult task, and it takes a community of interpretation, a community committed to conversation and dialogue about the New Testament text, and the question of just who Jesus Christ is for us today.
But it is a question that we will address together, and it is a question that we will address as we journey through the New Testament together this semester. I look forward to that journey with you, and as we begin it, I look forward to our first discussions as we address these questions. How do we read the Bible for our lives today?